some indication on this side? Are you able to hear me? Very good, thank you. Okay, get yourself organized. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to my class. Uh, this subject is engineers and society. And from this semester onwards, everything is new. Everything is a new beginning. It's called EG0001 course code. All right. Uh, they are all together a total of 12 two hours lecture. I will be teaching for the first six weeks. All right. So as far as I'm concerned, this week will be the first two hours lecture. Some students have asked me, is there a lecture next week, next Thursday? The answer is yes. We will have lesson next Thursday as well. All right. Uh, I shall begin my lecture. The first lecture is on history of engineering. All right. And uh, the so-called relevant textbook for this subject on the first lecture, History of Engineering, is this book. Uh, to be honest with you, do you really need to read this book? The answer is no. So I've taught this many, many years. Have any student come to see me to borrow this textbook? No. So I presume you will be the same for this year. All right? You do not really need to read the textbook but you just listen to me, come to class. That will be more than sufficient. All right, let us start with the lecture. I'm happy to see all of you. What is the place of history in engineering? Or in simple terms. What has engineering done to society? Is what we are asking ourselves this question. Actually, it's a chronologies of past events that help us to understand why things happen. All right, for example, we will be wondering why there are earthquakes. It's no longer about someone upstairs want to punish us, giving us an earthquake, but rather we are able to explain through engineering the phenomena behind earthquake. So it's no longer a myth, it's something that we can understand. And that's what engineers are for, able to provide an answer. Now, engineers also help to present the past in a way that makes more sense to the present. Like for example, when you must be wondering, why there's a need to invent wheels? And with the invention of wheels, what does it mean? It helps to move goods and people around. And eventually, it also helps to expand and the cultivation of land for human needs. All right, that part, engineers play a very significant role. Uh, then you must be wondering, engineers is just engineering, not related to anything else. The answer is no. In fact, engineers are, or engineering in itself is related not only to engineering itself, but social, religious, economical, and political aspects of human society. It's very un encompassing. All right? Engineering in human society. When did engineering really, be, really begin? A long, long time ago. During Stone Age, where humans started to create fire and control the use of fire. And that itself is engineering. As time progresses, we may ask ourselves this question. What is the connection 
between technology, science, and engineering. It first started with science. What is actually science? Science is an understanding of how the physical world works. Having science, it progressed to engineering. What is engineering? In simple terms, we make use of this science to make it work, to make it practical for the convenience and use of man. Let's say, for example, with this scientific knowledge, we see whether it's applicable to produce something, a machinery or a device or whatever that can help man to make use of it. All right? Then what is technology? Now, engineering only deals with the part of making it work. Technology, which is more complete. From the beginning to the ending, all right, we're talking about solving problems, meeting air needs. We look at it, how things are created, how things are solved, and how things are to be implemented in a systematic manner. And that is a connection from one step to the next and thereafter. So you must be wondering how does engineering affect society and the world we live? Then this is national education. You must be wondering as engineers, how can we improve life? How can we help to make life more meaningful by offering engineering solutions. For example, you look at it, many years ago, all right, there's a gentleman from China, Chai Lun. All right, he invented the composition for paper as well as paper making process. Now, don't underestimate this. With this invention, he can help to consolidate, to, to record knowledge so that he can, it can be passed to future generations. Records of knowledge, records of happenings. So the paper making process and the consequence of having paper, it actually helped to conserve, preserve knowledge and pass down to future generations. So, you as engineers will be doing wonderful things, all right? All right, let's look at it. Technological formation of human society. In fact, technology, this word is relatively new. It appeared less than 100 years ago. And in fact, the word technology is a collective noun. Collective noun means such that there's no such a thing called technologies. But the fact is that there are so many technology invented, people started to make use of the plural term, technologies. And it become accepted that technologies is actually a correct way of spelling. No choice. Life changes. English also have to change. So technology, it started to have science, engineering, the word come about less than 300 years ago. All right? And we have science, which appeared to be in the 15th century onwards. You have science, engineering, maybe 18th century onwards, technology less than 100 years ago. So the relationship with them is actually constantly evolving, changing. All right, over time. So let's look at specifically what is technology. Technology is a form of human cultural activity for practical ends and purposes. So as I said, technology is a totality solution. It's not only about forming, transforming ideas. You also have to carry on through, including solving it, meeting end needs, and looking at the processes, the implementation 
over the developments. All right, so that is technology in today's context. All right, but when we talk about it, as I said, the word, the term, keep on evolving. Like for example, many, many years ago, we have things called businessmen. Now, next time, don't call yourself a businessman. You're a hawker center fellow, then you're called businessman. People beginning to call entrepreneurs. But in years to come, people may not want to call entrepreneurs. They may call technopreneurs. And maybe your time, your future, may no longer like to coin the word technopreneur. Something more hip words may be used. We never know as time progress, right? So early technologies is like engineering. It occurred during the Stone Age where human ancestors were hunter, gatherers taking advantage of animal life and seasonal variation of plant produce. So what they done to survive is to adopt a systematic actions to survive. So what are the early technological development? Make tools from wood and stone for survival purposes. Stones were fractured to produce sharp objects for cutting. Uh, along with that, they developed grinding stones, wedges, eggs and spur to, to kill animals for consumption. But more important, in the early technology that allowed human to survive up to today is the creation and the control of fire. All right. Fire is very, very important, not only for other purposes. The main thing of fire is to protect yourself. Human need to sleep, right? We need to sleep eight hours to 10 hours a day. If everybody is sleeping, who is going to protect you? You may end up eating, eaten up by the animals. So with this creation of fire, it helps to protect human beings. So just imagine, our ancestor, creation of fire, control use of fire, allow us to stay prolonged until this day. All right? Okay. What is the turning point in human history? The turning point is that human no longer behave like nomads. You know what are nomads? They wander around. All right. So they no longer wander around but stay put to survive. How are they going to stay put to survive? They need to find a location whereby there is possible of food. How to do that? Grow crops. How to grow crops? Fertile land. Where is the fertile land? Near to the river banks, all right? Where the soil is soft for cultivation, this and that. So turning point in history is actually, we call it the agrarian society. In places like Mesopotamia, this is the old term, Mesopotamia is something like the modern day of Iraq. All right. So Mesopotamia is an old place, modern day times, we call it Iraq. The Nile Valley and other parts of India and China. And what they do? They have fertile land, provide conditions for crop production, as well as they keep domesticated animals as beasts of burden means when you are better, you don't carry things, all right? Piece of burden like, like all these uh, donkeys this and that to help you to carry. Like, just to share, national education, right? When I was in the army many years ago, 40 over years ago when I was in the army, we carry all our barang barang. Few years ago, there was an article made helping recruits to carry their barang barang back to camp. What a shameful thing. All right. We are resilient. I hope you are equally resilient. All right. So the turning point in history is that human beings are staying put. Now, what is the turning point of view? Have you ever imagined 
the turning point of you will be when you get married, when your kids come along, then you got shoulder, a heavy shoulder to, to, to carry, and that is your turning point. Listen to me, that is always right. Okay, in the agrarian society, engineers also come to work. All right, what they do? What have they done? What have they contributed? They've done a lot of things. Basically, during that agrarian society, they develop transportation system for mobility, as well as building technology. Because they stay put, they need to build houses. All right. They need to build houses. They are growing crops. Let's say, for example, they grow broccoli. Don't expect them to eat broccoli 365 days a, a year. What happens if uh, your mom every day cook broccoli for you to eat? Will you go home and eat? Very rarely you go back home. 365 days. So they need to create some exchange. Like maybe today, I only grow, grow broccoli. I may want to eat cauliflower. So I need to exchange with someone growing cauliflower, all right, or other types of vegetables. So they invented transportation system. They invented balance beam for weighing, all right. They invented portal wheels to, to actually transfer, transport all these things for exchange. And all these things need iron. And they develop smelting technology of metals, and also growing crops, very important. They need water, hydraulics. So water resources become part of their technological development. So that is the agrarian society. Now, let's move on. During this period, we have to build building as well as uh, other types of technology. The Mesopotamians built using bricks, all right? Egyptians built using stones. Like for example, the Great Pyramid of the Giza, 230 meters square, 140 meter high using massive stone. And each stone block is 2 to 30 tons each. They will assemble with accuracy that beyond your imagination. Have you ever wondered how they carry all these bricks or stones of such heavy weights and yet assemble them to precision? I leave it to you to imagine. Don't worry, it's not an exam question. Exam will never ask you this. But learning is about asking the right question. All right. It's interesting to find out. You must have that curiosity. The Greek culture that followed was built on Egyptian foundation. Means now we started off with agrarian society. All right, where humans start stop wandering around. As nomads, they stay put, produce to feed themselves. Then after that, we started to proceed to the next phase called classical antiquity. What is that? It's actually the cultural history centered on Greece and Rome. Rome. Have you watched the show Troy, Troy, Achilles, all right? Trojan horses, ah, that is the era. Now, you look at the term classical. Classical means there are some form of culture, some form of philosophical development, all right? So when you talk about classical antiquity, you are not only talking about human become smarter, more uh, philosophical, more scientific, 
So during that time, you got philosophies, philosophers such as Socrates, Plato, they are trying to explain the world through rationality rather than myth. And there are also scientists, all right, that scholars started to, to find truth to, to, to certain phenomenon. Like, for example, we have Euclid, Pythagoras, Plato, Archimedes, all these things. But, but during that time, during that time, the classical antiquity, these scientists, even whatever they do something, is all about mathematics. They do not work based on deductive or inductive approach. All right, or using mechanical models to explain something. So at that time, it's all about mathematics. All right, during the classical antiquity. Ah, uh, that era, the Romans and the Greeks people were fighting. If you realize that, eventually, who won the war? I did not, your notes have, do not have this because these are not important. That's why I don't put it there. All right. The Greeks were finally defeated by the Romans at the Battle of Corinth in 146 BC. So what happened? The Romans become the king. So what they do? They inherited the Greeks' philosophy and mathematics, but did not encourage abstract science. So you can see from here that engineering started to take some distinct shape. And like we no longer talk about so theoretical. There's some sense of practical understanding. All right, there's some sense of not so theoretical, but that's why they dis did not encourage abstract science. Then you started to see the term engineering practice become more recognizable. All right, engineering. So had engineers competent in contracts, specifications, routes facilitate rapid troop movement throughout the empire, Romans excel hydraulics in the olden days for survival. We need three things, at least. Oxygen, air, that is free of charge. And you need water. Water, very, very important. Hydraulics. Water for yourself, for your crops, for your domesticated animals. Everything. So hydraulics become important. And also, they need a roof over your head. Building. All right. This and that. So they have excel in buildings this and that all right so romans go up must come down what causes roman to fail technologically stagnant at that time enjoying themselves don't do so much work all the work was done by slaves and then their income their income, their wealth come from imperial endeavors to invade and fortify cities. Means to say that they are actually robbing other countries' wealth by invading them. So eventually, they crumble around 400 to 500 ADs. What happened after that? After that, relatively chaos expected. All right, when an empire fell, uh, fallen, relatively chaos, expansion of population, you need more land for humans habitation, so you cultivate new land, the forested lowland that require new agriculture technology to till the heavy soil. Uh, you guys may not, are not silver engineers. I'm a silver engineer near to the river banks where there are water movement, 
most of the soil around the river banks are soft, all right? If you go inward into the you got hills and mountains, the hills and mountains, all the it's harder soil. If the soil is not hard, you may never form it a uh, hill, right or wrong, you will collapse. That's common understanding, okay? So they have to work very hard and in face of a problem, engineers come up with solution. How, how to create new agricultural technology, all right, to work on this heavy soil, that sort of things. All right, like just to share with you, a few weeks ago, the government released that the new MRT line will pass through a very huge boulder. All right, instead of diverting, we will go through this boulder. Our engineer, civil engineer says that can, can go through, no problem. All right, so that's technology. We are faced with a problem, we tackle it head on. No issue, we will be able to, to, to build the MRT going through this, cutting through this boulder. All right, a challenge is presented, we face it and we solve it. I hope you guys are like that in years to come. So, after the Romans, after the, the classical antiquity, then we started to have a new system of governance, a new way coming along. We call it feudalism. Feudalism, because you have kings, powerful nobles, give land grants to members or retinues. Retinues are their servants, their close friends, this and that who render military service. At that time, you can sense that during this feudalism, the word slave started to disappear. And then we come up with a new term called serfs. What are serfs? In simple terms, Serf are tenanted farmers. Tenanted farmers means to say that if I work hard, I will get a lot in return. In a sense, let's say for example, I cultivated a lot of things. This is my duty. I pay it back to my owner. Whatever remains is yours. It's different from slave. Slave, you work hard, you don't work hard. At the end of the day, you got zero dollar. Right, that's the difference. So a tenanted farmers, a serfs, if they work hard, eventually, over years, they become rich merchants. All right? So you can see that there are primitive accumulation of capital because people are becoming rich and richer over the years, even though they work as serfs, this and that. So political sovereignty was fragmented because after the post-Roman Empire, there's no distinct own ruler. Everybody becomes king. There are many fragmented cities, formation of fragmented cities, this and that. Now, we started to, to actually go beyond that. You look at it. Initially, we talk about crops, crops, vegetables for human consumption. Then there's an era emergent of craft-based technology. Craft-based technology means to say that we are no longer talking about just agricultural production. We go beyond that. Commodity, not only producing agricultural products, we are also into commodity production, and that resulted in the formation of medieval craft guilds, which plan production, supervise, train. So economy based on serfs and craft workers. Now serfs are related to agricultural production. Craft workers are related to commodity production. They become the main driver of the economy no longer about slave and therefore the use of labor saving technology becomes more and more prevalent 
and it's a necessity. So there are some changes along the way, major social changes in Europe. And uh, one of the most notable one is the bubonic plaque, the Black Death in Europe. Now, at that time, medical care wasn't that good. 40% of the population was lost as a result of this. What's the outcome? With 40% population loss, tremendous labor shortage. All right, power based on land holding was also challenged by town based merchants. So you can see that feudalism is losing its power. All right, so power was increasingly centralized in monarchies. So monarchies are suspicious of feudal barons, this and that. So you can see that over time, from agrarian society, you go to classical, antiquity, feudalism, and then you move on to monarchy system. All right. Now, what are the major changes during the monarchy system? You realize that uh, medieval technology, military, and print, they have to strengthen the monarchies. They need to strengthen. Monarchies introduce armies, permanent bureaucracy, taxation, and the beginning of unified markets. When you have monarchy system, you start to collect taxes because who is going to feed the king? The king need money, right? In those days, the king got many mistresses, wives, and this and that, you know, concubines, many to feed. So they need a lot of taxation. Fair enough or not? I don't know. So rich monarchs backed by powerful merchants set the condition of the rise of merchant capitalism. The merchant capitalism is a result of feudalism as well. Because you no longer have slaves, you got serfs, the serfs work very hard. Eventually, they have a lot of money, they become merchants, and they become capitalists. All right, this is part of the, the process. So also, ships set sail to open the way for the discovery of the new world of America. So you can see that emergence of merchant capitalism starts to work. Capitalism. All right, because people are begin, becoming richer. All right? Preambles to the Renaissance period. Now, what is Renaissance? Last semester, I set a question on Renaissance. And I can tell you, of the five questions I set, essay question, this question has the lowest average marks. All right. You see, students don't know how to answer this because the reason is that when you learn engineering society, don't try to remember anything, everything. Just understand what is act was actually happening. What are the changes involved? That's good enough. Like for example, I did ask what is the Renaissance period. I will summarize it to you afterwards. You have a rediscovery of the Greek and Roman culture. Poets, artists, sculptors embraced new humanistic perspectives that were far from medieval religious symbols. Centers were established for learning in theology, law, and medicine. Leonardo da Vinci is the best example of a Renaissance man. Why is he called a Renaissance man? Because he's not only as an engineer, he's also artistic. All right? He's a man of multi-talent. All right? You know what is Mona Lisa? The drawing? This and that. So during that period, not just about production, not about production. It's also the humanistic aspect, like arts, all right, beyond science. So we have this scientific revolution is also during the Renaissance period. Let me go back earlier. I said during the classical antiquity, scientists 
only interested in mathematics. They don't talk about deductive approach. They don't talk about mechanical models. They don't talk about inductive approach. But during this Renaissance period, scientists beginning to, to be more daring, to tell the whole world that I'm using inductive approach, I'm using deductive approach, I'm using mathematical model, uh, mechanical model to explain things. There's some level of acceptance. People begin to accept that this is part of the theory, this is part of going ahead. So at the end of the 16th century, uh, a new view of nature, like for example, this Galileo. Galileo beginning to challenge that the earth revolve around the sun, rather than the, that the, the sun revolve around the earth, this and that. All right. So uh, Francis Bacon was using inductive approach to draw conclusions from experimental data. Rene Descartes emphasized deductive approach, advocates that science and religion should be separated, promote the advancement of science. So all in all, let me answer the question to my question one. There are many things changes. First thing is that Religion is no knowledge. Knowledge is no longer controlled by the church alone. Knowledge is meant for all. That is one of the important things during the Renaissance period. And the second thing is no longer about science. It's about humanistic aspects as well. All right, it goes beyond science. And the third thing is that scientists, this and that, no longer talk about just theory, mathematics. It goes beyond that. We beginning to accept practical understanding of the, the issue like deductive approach, inductive approach, this and that. All right? So you can see that there's a practical orientation of knowledge Knowledge was much less controlled by the church. The earth-centered cosmos Aristotle gave way to the acceptance of the solar system. Knowledge became a means of controlling nature. All right? Knowledge for all. It's not confining to the church during that time. So you can see that major changes are taking place. Ah. Uh, Along that period, we have ships fitted with navigational aids and firearms. Uh, Europe set sail to explore and conquer foreign lands to seize new resources. See how good you are. Britain invaded India, all right, fortified in India. They set up the West Indies company, this and that. Now, what resources, what, which resources they brought it back at that time, back to England? You will be surprised. One of the main things they brought back is salt. At that time, no refrigeration. Now salt, very cheap, right? At that time, they brought back a lot of salt from India. Why is it so? Salt is very important for the preservation of food as well as making it taste better. All right? This and that. So, time changes. Now I give you salt, you also don't want. All right? Okay. So, in the 16th century, Spain and Portugal led overseas conquests. The Netherlands also went to Indonesia, all right, Netherlands. Britain used its large coal deposit to drive industries, surpassed the Netherlands. So during that time, you also have, we call it empire building, how to build empire, move your troops far and wide. So exploration, all right. Okay, 
What happened is this. Capital accumulation, agricultural revolution, monopolies in mining, manufacturing and foreign trade were granted by monarchs to the court favourites and merchant guilds. In 1624, British Parliament reduced the royal power, land holding under the feudal system was officially abolished. Rich merchants implemented efficient large-scale scientific farming practice that lead to the productivity to satisfy the expansion of markets, we have this agricultural revolution. In simple terms, we have the agricultural revolution. After the agricultural revolution, you have the industrial revolution. What's the difference? Just looking at it on the surface. When we talk about agricultural revolution, we are talking about improvements done to produce more and more crops. Understand? Industrial revolution, we are talking about producing goods, not only for human consumptions, producing machines for machines, tools for machines. Understand what I mean? That is the essence of industrial revolution. Means it go beyond just producing things for human, he also produced things for machines to use. Producing tools for machines to make use of it as well. That itself is industrial revolution. So preambles to the industrial revolution, preamble means before, all right, something before. Urban merchants with banking and exchange practice gain control of commodity production means to say that urban merchants are initially serfs. All right, they accumulated enough capital, they started to, to work beyond the agricultural products, they started to work on commodities production, and then as they grow bigger and bigger, they started to have banking and exchange practice with them. So there's a new social class of people. And these people are merchants. All right, capitalists form new social class. In fact, these capitalists are merchants. And their ancestors are serfs, most of them. All right, because they work hard. So they emphasize freedom to invest and trade. All right. Plunders from the colonies help to finance the Industrial revolution take off because they rob money, they have enough money to use. So continuous exploitation of colonial resources sustained European industrial growth and left a legacy for underdeveloped colonies. One example is countries around us. All right, don't want to mention names. Okay. So what happened during the Industrial Revolution? The guilds were weakened by anti-monopoly legislation. The guilds were very powerful, all right? And there was also like Industrial Revolution. As I said earlier, you produce products not for human consumption, you produce machines for machine usage, you produce tools for machine usage. So in that sense, one important thing must be discovered, and that is to work on iron. Smelting of iron, how to work with iron is important. If you fail to, to produce technology to smelt iron, as good as you are not able to produce machines, but produce tools. So in this case, thanks to this person called Abraham Darby, in 1709, how to use coal to smell iron. And we have this person called Adam Smith, division of labor in pin making, how to divide work to increase productivity. And then once production process was standardized, this process can be replaced by a machine. And then development of this machine complete the transformation into modern industrial production. All right technological advance, enhancement, how to make machines. 
In order to make machine, you must know how to smell iron. As simple as that. All right? So, the Industrial Revolution, another term for it is the machine age. What happened? Mechanization of tasks led to profusion of machines. Journeymen reduced to machine minders. Many terms you may not know. One of the terms you may not know is called journeyman. What is journeyman? Walk around is called journeyman, right? Anybody can tell me? Okay, I'll give you a hint. You watch Star Wars or not? Huh? When you become, to join the Jedi, first of all, you become what? Apprentice. After you graduated from being an apprentice, do you still call yourself a master yet? Not yet. During the period after your apprenticeship, you fight, fight, fight with the dark side. And you gain enough experience. That period, you are called journeyman. Then after that, you fought, you successfully fight, kill a few of them, you become a Jedi master. Correct or not? Ah. You watch the last show or not? Ah, uh, I watch. Okay, Ray Skywalker. When was she become a Jedi master? Was she called a Jedi master yet? Before that? Never mind. So a journeyman is actually someone who graduated from apprenticeship but not fully trained yet, so on the job training. But in those days, in those days, a journeyman will do his craft. Now the journeyman, instead of doing that craft, he look after machine. All right. Okay. People sold their raw power to owners and factories. The Industrial Revolution provided employment, population growth because they suffer bubonic Pluck, 40% of the people were killed. Population growth was both an underlying cause and fuel for the Industrial Revolution because population growth, demand for goods and services increased. All right? More and more things are needed. So, we can say that in the machine age, machine taking over. All right? We are moving towards the artificial intelligence age. AI will take over your life. I'm not sure whether you see this. About two, three months ago, there was a China conference. Two very important person were talking. All right. One of them is Jack Ma. The other person in front of him talking is the one that from America. Guess who? Anybody? Ah, develop some supersonic cars one. Ah, okay. Jack Ma was in the view that human will still control artificial intelligence, control AI. However, Elon Musk, which is the other person, is less positive than that. We may, after all, be controlled by machines. Never know. All right. So machines are taking over even those days. All right. Now, it may be much more dangerous. Beware. So, power to drive machine. Steam power was harnessed for use by, in machines by in the 17th century. Now, many people make mistakes. In fact, a lot of people think that the steam engine was invented by James Swap. The answer is wrong. All right. In reality, Thomas Savory was the person who invented the steam engine. All right. You know what steam engine or not? For those chemical, electrical, you know when we produce steam. The steam is hot 
And once hot, hot air rises, all right, you start to move parts. As simple as that. Okay? Uh, but in reality, when Thomas Savory produced that machine, which was not efficient. It's James Wang that make it work very well. So at the end of it, James Wang got all the credit. All right? But the real person who invented it is Thomas Savory. Never mind. So James Watt improved it, and that itself improved steam drove new machinery, took British industry to world leadership. Steam engine formed the basis for the rise of mechanical engineering profession. In the olden days, we only have silver engineers. Silver engineers are the first profession. Then we started to have mechanical engineers. And then we started to have electrical, chemical, biological, this and that. But that is subsequently. Okay, this is James Swap steam engine. You can still go to London and have a look. I tell you what, if you go to London or England, visit all the museums, aircon, beautiful place free of charge all right don't go to paris visit museum it costs you a bomb all right not cheap one thing good about england especially london you visit all the museum all free one nobody chase you out all right you can sleep there as well okay uh typically for my lesson when you reach 320 we'll take a 10 minutes break before we continue. So it's the right time to take a break. And I'm happy to see the class almost fill up. We will restart 10 minutes time. <laughs>
Hello. Uh, can you guys hear me again? I changed the mic, mic, microphone. The sound system okay? Please give some indication. How about the side? Okay. Now, uh, welcome back. Before I continue talking about the lecture, let's go to some logistics of this course. All right. So for this course, Okay, I have put down an announcement. Uh, the class size is about 2,000 students if all register and all turn up. So if you have any queries, please don't write email to me. The first line of defense is to write to whatever school coordinator that you're involved in. If you are in triple E, please either write to your tutor or write to the coordinator, Professor Ling Kik Woon, to answer your query. All right. I have received many emails. Sir, got online recording and all. I received many of them. If you want to ask such question or related question, please ask your coordinator. Don't direct to me. All right, here. Now, the answer to that question, whether there's online recording, yes, there is. All right, all recorded. Then the second thing, many students also write to me, Sir, week one got tutorial and all. Of course, I cannot scold you. I already listed here. Week one, no tutorial. All right. Week two, next week, I know that tutorial falls one day before Chinese New Year Eve. I'm a Chinese. I know that Chinese New Year one day before Chinese New Year Eve, there's no celebration. Please come for the tutorial. It's a very important tutorial. Why is it important? Because a few things. The first thing is that you need to form groups. You form the wrong, wrong group with the wrong people, nobody wants to work with you, you run into trouble. Please come. And second thing is selection of topics. All right? Please come. Now, then after that, week three, we try not to have tutorial so that presentation can start in week four. Give ample time for those assigned to present in week four to have time to prepare. Now, unfortunately, some of you guys may have tutorial scheduled on Friday. All right, Friday, unfortunately, for semester two, this year, we have two holidays on Friday. One is Chinese New Year Eve. Most of them may not have classes. And then we have Good Friday. So accordingly, may not have enough time. Your tutor will write to you whether you should come for week three tutorial or not. All right? Because let's say, for example, week two, next Friday, if they cancel the tutorial, you may need to come for week three as a makeup. Understand what I mean? Your tutor will be the best person to answer your query. Okay? Then the next thing is that coming to it, for your part, you only need to know, look at only two folders here. Information, is this. Whatever needed to tell you is written there. For examination, final is 60%, presentation is 40%. All right, you need to, this is the marking rubric. All right, the tutor in week two will explain to you in detail. Please ask the tutor. Assign for your presentation group to explain to you the marking rubric. All right, this is a teaching schedule. And then, uh, now, I have to tell you one important thing is that this year, this semester, the code has been unified to one, EG0001. It's a new beginning. Everything is 
not the same same a little bit different examination is not the same as the past year one some revision to it good news and bad news good news is that question one is multiple choice there are 10 of them 10 multiple choices question out of four choose one easier instead of five choices you choose the correct answer only four all right four choices to choose to pick the right answer so there are 10 mcq each one is two marks that's question one then question two to five each question comprises two sub essay questions each one 10 marks so you write less this year round so in, su in summary there are five questions question one 10 mcq question two mark two marks each question two to five each question in two to five comprise two sub question each sub question 10 marks 80 marks in total plus the mcq 20 marks in total total 100 marks all right so that is the change and then the next thing you look at is here the you want to for those who are new look at the recorded lecture you will be able to click on to view it everything is recorded don't believe me i show you the rq studio schedule all right all recorded stated down there this for recording now all the notes are given here history all that i, I put down there i've listed down there the oral presentation topics your tutor will this give you a way to select topics for you all right you can see this and that so so much so for the course side uh, let me re-emphasize again if you have any question do not ask me please help ask your tutor or the course coordinator first understand if it's beyond them your course coordinator will forward to me and I will answer it. Is that clear? All right. Okay. If no question, let me continue. Now, industrial revolution requires not only able to Produce machines for machines, tools for machines. You need one more important thing, markets. All right. How to move your products, your machines, your goods to other markets. That means to say that there's a need to transport them. Move far and wide. All right. Fortunately, fortunately, we have this person called George Stevenson. He created and invented a rocket locomotive. Now, our generation now, when we say rocket, we fly up. At that time, rocket means fly horizontally. Not the same, all right. In those days, words change. Rocket now is like that, vertically up, then called rocket. In those days, as long as you go faster than human, that's rocket really, horizontally. All right? So this is his rocket. Now you look at it, you laugh. But in those days, people really worship him for this rocket. All right? So George Stevenson, in 1829, introduced successfully the rocket locomotive that set sail. For the railway age railway age is very very important you open up broader markets for goods and services the building of railroads was a major factor in colonization of much of the rest of the world as well as transporting goods and services all right okay what are the contributors to industrial evolution you need to remember them for examination answer is no just for your understanding, this guy called Thomas Telford, 
he is the first British to be called silver engineer. All right? And then, this person, all these are people involved in Thames, Thames Canal. This is Umbert Brunel. He's his son. When the father is rich, the son is more heavy. So don't be rich. All right? Well dressed, like a playboy like that. His son. In fact, it may be true. But anyway, just to highlight to you that George Stevenson is the first person, the first president of IMACE. So he started with mechanical profession. All right? Now, what is the highest point of Britain industrialization? It's the building of this Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by a fire. All right? Fire. And that itself also caused many things to happen. So you look at it, it was, after building, it looks like that. After destroying by fire, it looks like that. Okay? Uh, anybody know where exactly this location is or not? Where the Crystal Palace exhibition was built? If you've been to London, if I remember correctly, you heard of a station called King Cross Station? It's at that location. All right. Now, King Cross location, when I was there in the 1970s, them smelly, everybody urine there. All right. They like to urine inside the MRT station. Never mind. But now, King Cross Station is very modern, like one of the MRT stations in Orchard Road. All right. Okay, things have changed. With such modern facilities, nobody there to urine. Cameras are there. All right. Okay. We are talking about the British. Other people are moving forward. Not only the British are moving forward. Let's talk about the challenges from the US. Settlers in the US were extremely utilitarian. What is utilitarian? You will learn economics. You learn about the utility theory, right? Exactly the same. Utili utilitarian means the moral worth of a person is determined by its outcome. Means, in other words, how successful you are in the future is measured by how much money you earn, where you stay. All right, that's American thinking. All right. It's not about your social values, your upbringing, your behavior. The American believe in that. So with that belief, they saw knowledge as a commodity. It's wrong to say knowledge as a commodity. More knowledge is your personal enhancement, understanding how the world, all right, it's not about a commodity, but the Americans at that time saw it as a commodity. They saw it as a commodity means they see it that it's an opportunity to make money. So American entrepreneurs designed industrial equipment that reduced dependency on labor, led in machine shop techniques, and then produced highly standardized products of interchangeable parts. Means to say that you produce this part, you can use for that machine and another machine as well of different nature. So it helped to increase the market for your tools and machinery. The Americans recognized the need to encourage domestic manufacturing, domestic consumption. All right? So expansion of the American railroads was both a plus and a negative point. And uh, America have civil war, and then they fought with modern equipment. The plus point is that after the end of the war, they link the north to the south. A good example is that the first train continental rail saw train loads of buffalo skins going east for manufacture into consumer products. All right, so you look at it. 
industrialization. You need to produce machines for machines. We need to move products far and wide. So these are the two main ingredients, vehicles for it to happen. All right. So transportation of goods, machinery, railway roads. All right. So what are the engineers? Prominent engineers in America. You got Robert Fulton. Never mind. You don't need to remember, but just remember. Not for remembering for exam. Just use as a plus point. Ellie Vigney. All right, this gentleman. He wanted to be a lawyer. Wanted to be a lawyer. Wanted to make money as a lawyer. All right. Somewhere, somehow along the line, that dream did not materialize. He ended up ended up becoming an engineer. And becoming an engineer, he patented a simple cotton gene to separate fiber from seeds, milling machine with automatic feed, this and that. Eventually, he made tons and tons of money. So the moral of the story is that, don't worry. As engineers, if you come up with something, you're going to earn a lot of money more than doctors more than lawyers much much more i'm not joking i'm serious you heard of singaporeans many of them become very very rich you know uh the game what tan something raisin tan or what the de game developer all right make a lot of money. So don't worry, as engineers, your days will come. All right? So take this Ely Whitney as your inspiration. All right? Okay. What goes up must come down. Obvious. This coming down could be from yourself, and it could also be people are getting better. All right? Like for example, I'm an Arsenal supporter, football. Ah, Arsenal supporter. Arsenal is going downhill. First of all, the players are going downhill. A second thing, other people are improving. So, twin effect on you. All right? So, Britain loss of industrial leadership, first of all, look at himself first. Complacency in in society, complacency, you don't work so hard. You got enough money. The peaceful and protracted transfer of power from aristocracy to rising capitalist state foster self-limiting development. Means no fight, no blood, nothing. So very peaceful, no revolution, cannot improve. All right. Okay, that's what I mean. Industrialization in Britain was indigenous, means not looking far and wide, only accommodating to existing structure. The world market is not, is the one that you should aim for. Just the next time you develop something, don't just develop for Singapore or even Southeast Asia. Develop something for the world, world where the market is. All right, like for example, I'll give you a case. Microsoft, how they make money. Microsoft need a lot of people to come into their system. They help those de game developer, they help all those software developer to come on board. Free of charge, give you advice. But the main thing, get into their platform. So that when they get in their platform, they need Microsoft operating system to work on it, and everybody need to purchase that. And that's where they make the world market. What for they make from the developer of that software? How much can you make? You are only making from one person, right? The world. So they only look at themselves. 
Pressures to adopt values and interests of industrialization were resisted by the ruling elite. All right, you are rich and powerful. You worry that people will come out and dethrone you. You control knowledge. You control industrialization. Ended up worse. All right? And also universities. Pursuit of scientific knowledge for their own sake. Neglected and undervalued commercial application. You give an example. You know what is MBA program, right? MBA program started in America very long ago. The British resisted it, saying that no bloody use. So MBA was not offered in British universities at the beginning. So they lose out. They lost the market. So eventually when they offer MBA program, very few people go to UK to do MBA, right? If you're talking about MBA, most of them go to America to do. So this is what their thinking is. The British preoccupation of individually fit final product discourage standardization, and worse still, they love the steam engine so much, as though it's the king. The reality is that steam engine is inferior, very inferior to the another machine called internal combustion engine or machine. This one, much more powerful. All right. For those who are not so sure, those mechanical engineers will move on. You know what is PBT, right? P is pressure, B is volume, T is temperature. PV divided by T is a constant. All right, the fundamental principle. So, you look at steam engine. Steam engine make use of only heat, temperature. How to compare with PVT? Am I right? No fight, completely. But never mind, they love it. Okay? So France and Germany developed the internal combustion machine without real competition. US were prepared to buy standardized items, mass production. The same machine tool will use across everywhere. All right? And they, they keep on improving. Like, for example, exemplary line. One of the pioneers in exemplary line is by Henry Ford. All right? You know what is exemplary line? Production of a car. Like, your job is to fit the wheel into the car. That's all you do. Do nothing. You look at this gentleman, all these gentlemen, the car roll forward. Your job is to push the wheel into it, tighten it, tighten it, and there it goes. All right. So that is called, we call it moving assembly line technique to produce automobiles. All right. So start of the modern industrial era. Uh, just to recap. In 1860 to 1900, manufacturing replaced agriculture as a leading source of economic growth in the U.S. So, more and more money, the economy generated more based on manufacturing rather than based on agriculture. All right? In the second half of the 19th century, the manufacturing industry was itself transformed. What does the transformation mean? You just, manufacturers are shifting to produce products for consumers to producers. When I say producing products to producers means actually you are producing machines for machines, tools for machines, this and that, rather than for consumer usage. And you know that machines are all made of matter matter. All right? So what does that mean? Heavy industry become the norm. Make a lot of money. Become the popular one. So steel, iron, petroleum, machinery grew rapidly, boosted by a number of technical innovations. Price of raw materials fell. It stimulated demand, new demands and further technological changes. One thing good about it is that I only can differentiate between a German and a non-German. 
You look at it without looking at the details. This style of look, very fierce look, no nonsense type German. All right. This is a German. Ah. I also can differentiate between a Spanish and a other types. All right. This spy is called Bismarck. He became the Chancellor of Germany in 1871 and he had a concerted drive towards industrialization. He also opened up the internal market. Very important. You produce, you must be able to sell. In order to sell, you must open up your domestic market as well as trading with others. In order to trade with others, you need real link. All right. So he pushed to expand foreign trades, export, export, promote education relevant to industrialization. That's the difference from Britain. Means practical orientation of knowledge rather than abstract science. So German manufacturers set closely integrated industrial research laboratories by 1900. Germany had surpassed Britain. All right, these are some of the people, European engineers and US. Who is this person? Can guess or not? Huh? Gustav Eiffel. Who is he? He's the builder of this Eiffel Tower. All right, he's an engineer. He built Eiffel Tower. All right. Who is this Thomas Alva Edison? Now, this Thomas Alva I leave it to you to know who, but he has a famous quote. When he failed, he always tell himself this, I found 10,000 ways that it does not work. He's famous for that quote. All right. So take it positively. Energize yourself. You fail one relationship, never mind. There are so many girls waiting for you again. All right. All right. That is what life is all about. Be positive. It's very positive. I found 10,000 ways it does not work. So back to relationship. I found one way it does not work. You have one failed relationship. You have 10 failed relationships, never mind. Tell yourself, I found 10 ways that it does not work in this way. You will improve yourself. All right. Okay, listen carefully. Very, very important. So important that you must listen. I never give hints for examination. But, but I try to reduce the scope of study. Some parts are for information. Some parts that I don't say out it may come out in examination. So what I'm trying to tell you is that from page 45 onwards to end of today's lecture is only for information. I will not set anything in examination. All right? Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want people to attend lectures to feel it. If it, people cannot attend lectures, at least go through the recorded lecture to pick up this news. Don't share with those who did not attend lectures. All right? I want people at least to attend lectures. If they don't attend lectures, they can pick up on this on online lectures. All right? So this page onward is not for examination. All right, it's talking about Engineering education, by the way, I haven't set the examination yet. Too early to set. But I can tell you that when I will put on record into my diary, this part will not be set. So en engineering education and the rise of the profession. Okay, let's look at the word UK. When first started, when first started, engineers are not trained under the university curriculum. It was first of all controlled by the city and, and Guild College, very, very famous city and Guild College. My classmate, 
did not attend university education. After A levels, he enrolled to the City and Guild College at that time. All right. He worked as an electrical engineer. His qualification, I got a degree. He also has a qualification from the City and Guild College, which is equivalent to a degree level. All right. On that count, what I'm trying to say is that when it first started, the, the guilds control the training of engineers. They are very powerful. They set the curriculum, uh, involve paying substantial fee for fire pupillage, pupillage in an engineering office. Then after that, over time, anti-monopoly comes into the picture and the university decided that it's the right place to train engineers. Nowadays, at this point of time, I think, if I'm not wrong, there's no such a thing called City and Guild College anymore. All right, this and that. So those were the days. So let's give you some understanding. John Smitten is the first man, first English man, to differentiate himself as a silver engineer. All right. I told you Thomas Telford was the first president of ICE, this and that. Now, how France trained their engineers? France is a little bit like US. Engineering training is also by the university as well as by the army. Cops, all right. So, France set up a specialized army called Corps of Engineers. So they established the first engineering school, something that I do not know how to pronounce, I don't pronounce. All right, in 1794, Ecole Polytechnic was established, and that's how they train engineers. In the US, how they train engineers? Quite similar to France. All right. But U.S. is much more powerful. They have the corps of engineers. In fact, a lot of civil engineering and mechanical things actually were, were the outcome of research done by the corps of engineers. All right? So they train engineers using the military engineering school, corps of engineers. And then they started to introduce to, to universities and so on. Uh, same as a poly in Germany. Uh, how about in Japan? Japan also Meiji restoration of a dismantled Japanese feudal system. Then they start to introduce uh, engineering education in the imperial universities. Military training centers also involved. All right. Uh, engineering education and the rise of a profession. You started in 17th, 18th century, you have the silver engineers. We start then in mechanical engineers. Now you have many different types of engineers biological engineers, chemical engineers. Just to share with you, currently in Singapore, we have the PE board. We got silver engineers, we got geotechnical engineers, we have mechanical engineers, electrical energy engineers. Eventually, you may have to have professional chemical engineers, this and that. All right, it's the development moving forward. And uh, these are the engineering education, a rise of a profession. Uh, this is self-explanatory, all right? Engineers are what we are, all because of advancement in sciences, all right? Timeline of modern technology. Uh, this one is not a totality set. It just pick up something that's interesting. Uh, TV was invented in 1926. When did I watch my first TV? I asked my parent to buy a TV in 1969 so that in 1970, 
I can see the first World Cup. All right. And I'm a footballer. I was a footballer. I'm also a football fan. All right. So I like to watch football. So I watch football. So finally, I managed to watch football. The 1970 World Cup. But that was 1926. My son somewhat is a footballer, but not a real footballer, a bluff one, an online footballer. He got FIFA games, right? football games, right? ah, he's damn good. Kick, don't know how to kick a ball, but know how to play the ball very well. Many of them. So 1926 is the invention of TV, and then 1996, Dolly the clone ship was born, and then many, many inventions. All right. So, as far as I'm concerned, we finished the lecture today. I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Normally, people clap hand at the end of my last lecture. I'm so happy that you clap hand today. <laughs>